Well, is the, is the sound okay? Perfect. All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming out today on this fine, sunny day. I started this lecture right after the last one. And like every other lecture, I probably got three times as much material as I needed. I, I started taking pictures around Knoxville and couldn't stop. And I have narrowed it down to the absolute bare minimum. I have about over 130 pictures here, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to take us a little while. Um, let me just once again do a little bit of promotion. Your Knox Area Civil War Sesquicentennial Commission is alive and well. We are, our website is there at the bottom. Um, we are attempting to get our routine together so that the calendar is right up to the minute so that you've got one place to go in Knoxville to find out what's going on with Civil War exhibits and reenactments and any of the other fine programming that is going to be happening during the next four years. So please keep us in mind when you're checking out what's going on in our area. Now, I did want to do just a little bit of review. I know I've showed you these pictures before. This is the beautiful Gettysburg battlefield. Gettysburg at night. Gettysburg at dusk. Chickamauga, Battle of Campbell Station. <laughs> or <laughs> Battle of Fort Sanders. As you can see, and I know I've said this before, Knoxville never did get its national park. And efforts to commemorate, to mark, to highlight, uh, to, to even remember have been a part of the continuous, in my, in my mind at least, a part of the continuing legacy of divided loyalties here in our city. It just isn't fun to remember when everybody lost. And to move on, to put it behind, referring as people did here, and I'm not sure the origin of the phrase, but referring to the recent unpleasantness as something to get past and get on with, looking to the future, to progress, not dwelling in the past. All of those things were in the minds of the people in the 18, after the war and into the 19th, early 1900s. And while there were efforts, while there were people who did know very well where things happened and did know the value of what it could mean to preserve these sites, there was never enough popular support to do what needed to be done to make that happen. So let's look at how Knoxville has commemorated historically, and then I want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing now to um, make it a little, more, a little easier for people to find that history. First of all, monuments. I think five or six years driving this regularly. Does everybody know where this one is? It's on 17th Street at the top of the hill. This is very close to where Fort Sanders itself was. Um, but I kept driving past, and you can see the fast lane is, is right there. It's in, in the sidewalk. There's no place to pull off. Even the street to the, uh, to, the, to the freeway side of it, you can't take a right-hand turn because it's one way in the other direction. It's very difficult to stop and see what this is all about. And when school is in session, as you know, trying to park anywhere around UT is almost impossible. So this is one of those monuments. It took me a long time to figure out what it was all about. And I kept thinking, isn't it a shame the statue was knocked off the top? Well, in fact, there never was a statue. This is what it looked like when it was installed in 19... 14 by the Daughters of the Confederacy, UDC Chapter 89 of Knoxville, and commemorate, of course, the of Fort Sanders location. Um, you can see the the uh, molded the, mo the the draped fabric, which is really very nice, and of course it's local stone. And there is, sorry, there is an inscription on there, and it says. Erected by the Daughters of the Confederacy, November 19th, 29th, 1914. To the memory of the Confederate soldiers who fell in the assault on Fort Sanders. Nor wreck, nor change, nor winter's blight, nor time's remorseless doom shall dim one ray of glory's light that gilds your glorious tomb. And so this has been really the main way that Knoxville ever acknowledged the site 
and the place of the Battle of Fort Sanders. And as you can see, the road's been widened, the sidewalk's probably widened. It just does, doesn't have that same resonance in any, any way at all that those major national battlefields do. Uh, same thing with this monument. This is another one that you might think, well, what's that all about? Uh, at first, I thought this was something to do with the Scottish Rites Temple, which is right beside it. Um, in a way, it is. It was erected by the 79th Highlanders. It was, er it was uh, dedicated in 1918, and it was, uh, well, you can see there, it was kind of between the uh, curb and the chain link fence. So just every, uh, I, I was going to uh, point out on the map on the wall, and when, when they get a little more obscure, I will, as to where these are located. And on our website, there will be a map that will have all of these sites annotated so you can go to see any of them. But this one is, is fairly obvious and pe most people have some idea that it's maybe to do with the Civil War and it is. The 79th Highlanders were the regiment inside the fort when the attack came on November 29th and they came here in 1890 in large numbers for the first Blue and Gray reunion and then in 1918 this uh, monument was commissioned and put um, on 16th and White, and it does happen to be near the Scottish Rites Temple. I'm not sure if that's coincidence or not, but of course the Highlanders uh, were predominantly Scottish regiment, and so th th there may be a connection between the land and the, uh, this, the pl placement of this temple. When the building was finished, it does look a little better now. The chain link fence came down and the construction uh, was uh, completed. But nevertheless, it's, not an, it's another one that is not easy to figure out what it's all about. Trying to stop and read it once again, there's no parking around there, and a uh, nice Sunday morning might be a good time to go look at it. This uh, has the two soldiers, blue and gray, shaking hands, and the monument itself says, the hands that once were raised in strife now clasp a brother's hand, and long as flows the tide of life, in peace or toil when war is rife, we shall as brothers stand, one heart, one soul, for our free land. So by this time there was a real feeling of uh, respect for both sides, respect for the soldiers, the brother soldiers. By 1914, of course, they were, most of the veterans were getting quite elderly, and there was a real feeling of um, having been through tragedy together, and there was a feeling of, of coming together, and especially in a place like Knoxville, uh, because as, as we know that people were as divided as the troops were here. Now, this is one you may not be as familiar with. Just curious, do most people know about this one? You are, of course, Civil War enthusiasts, so you may know. But this one is in Mount Olive Cemetery, which is down in South Knoxville on the old Maryville Pike. Uh, Mount Olive Church. Ah, thank you. Mount Olive Church is quite a, an old church, and in the, uh, is a monument. Um, it, it really is quite an interesting story, and it's a story that does not have very wide, um, um, not, people, people in a large, uh, in a wide area don't know about this story. It is, you can see there's uh, sculpted into the stone, is a side wheeler ship, and it says Sultana on it. The Sultana was a private vessel that was contracted by the, well, the now defunct Confederate um, Army. Uh, this, this was right after the, the war ended, right after, well, actually right after Lee signed uh, the document in Appomattox. There was a, a holding camp on the Mississippi River, and most of the soldiers in that camp were Unionists who had been at Cahaba or at Andersonville. These are guys that had made it through the whole of the war had made it through prison camp, were on their way home. And the ship itself was uh, built to hold about 346, 350 people. They ended up putting about 2,200 people on there. They were so eager to go home. It was over. They'd survived. About eight miles above Memphis, the boilers blew, three of the four boilers. 
Uh, and the overloading of this old ship was probably the reason why. There are some conspiracy theories that perhaps there were, uh, there were gunpowder in the logs that they threw into the boilers or some idea that it might have been sabotaged. And, and that's hard to, hard to prove or disprove at this point. But it's certainly possible that just because of the overloading and the condition that the boilers were in, that they exploded. And um, about, there were 17 to 1,800 casualties. In fact, about 400 um, actually went into the water. They were severely burned. Uh, well, no, I, I better bring my numbers back. There were 785 pulled from the river, and many of them severely burned. And of them, 200 the more died. So the total casualty is about 1,700 to 1,800. More than the involved and, and this uh, knew all about it and here we have the numbers carved into this monument from India 52 from Kentucky 125 from Michigan 243 460 from Tennessee 362 and the names uh, the Uh, kind of amazing. This is a photo of Sultana. You can see it says Sultana here on the side. And you can see how overloaded it was. And this is an artist's idea of what it looked like after the boilers blew and then people ended in the water. Many of them drowned. Um, many of them couldn't swim. So we have here in Knoxville one of the very few monuments to this disaster and a fairly active group of descendants who get together regularly. Where did I see Charlie? Yes, yeah, I know that your family is a part of this. Wow. When Mike Brown, I don't know, if, is Mike here? Three of his uncles died in this disaster. He's from South Knox County. And in their private family cemetery, they had a monument, an obelisk, uh, constructed to this event. Unfortunately, we went look, well, he went looking for it. He and I were going to go take pictures. Um, and he went out to see, to preview the site, and the monument is gone. Someone wow. has taken it. It was a private family cemetery out in the woods, unprotected. The monument's gone. But uh, it, it's amazing that three in one family were, were survived the war, survived prison camps, and ended up on that ship. Now sometimes there are monuments just because they are monumental in size. This is, of course, what at the time was called the Deaf and Dumb Asylum. And I understand since then it's been many different things, uh, most recently the Duncan Law School from uh, Lincoln Memorial University. And before that, was the TBA was in there. And uh, at any rate, if you look at this picture from 1865, you can see how very similar that building still is. This picture is still, we're still trying to figure out exactly what it's all about. They used to say that these were stacked guns. And now they think maybe they're bean poles. And that perhaps these wreaths would be mourning wreaths and that this was taken shortly after Lincoln's assassination. And look at these two guys. I can't imagine standing up on top of that thing, but there they are having their picture taken. And 150 years later, you can see it's very much the same. This building was used throughout the war. Confederates used it as a hospital. The Union used it as a hospital. And uh, it was, obviously, it was, well, it was built in 1848. It was there all through the war, and it still stands today. All right, cemeteries. Confederate Cemetery was originally and still called Bethel Cemetery. It was uh, ac actually 
the idea and the creation of the Ladies Memorial Society. The Ladies Memorial Society, Associ Ladies Memorial Association, make sure I get the name right, um, they began to come together, Lady, it's the Ladies Memorial Society of Knoxville. It was organized in 1868, and Mrs. Hugh McClung was the first president. The McClungs were very much involved uh, in uh, Confederate remembrances um, all through the uh, later years and uh, into the uh, 1900s also uh, in the person of Ellen McClung Green's husband. He was very active in uh, uh, Confederate Veterans Affairs. And at any rate, they uh, decided that they were going to reinter the co Confederate burials that were around and about, and also some were already there. Eventually, about 1,600 were reinterred at Bethel Cemetery. The name Bethel was chosen because in, I wrote this down so I'd get the citation right, Genesis 28, 18, 19, uh, Jacob puts, piously puts up a stone pillar in a place he called Bethel. So that's the reason that they chose that name for the cemetery. They always intended to put a monument in there and they had to work, well, from 68 to 92 in order to raise enough money to, to actually have this monument created and installed. Very impressive. Uh, the sto soldier at the top is actually eight feet tall, and he was uh, sculpted and designed by Lloyd Branson, of, uh, who many know as an artist and uh, painter in, in Knoxville. I just like this picture. This was taken in color, but on a, obviously a very gray day in November. And uh, it's a very somber place. It's also, I don't know if you can see here, well, out here it's surrounded by chain link fence with barbed wire at the top. It's not a very inviting place. Uh, it's also open only by appointment because it just can't be protected 24 hours a day. But it belongs to uh, Mabry Hazen uh, foundation property and so if you ever want to go in to see this place you can contact uh, Mabry Hazen House and make an appointment but it's it's locked almost always unless uh, less special arrangements are made now this is also a very long inscription um, <laughs> I spent quite a while trying to figure out what this said and then found out if I checked my uh, research it was already printed out but what it says was uh, uh, poem that perhaps was by um, one of the uh, politicians who was there, who was also a poet. Um, the poem says, And their deeds, proud deeds, shall remain for us, and their names, dear names, without stain for us, and the glories they won shall not wane for us. In legend and lay, our heroes in gray, though dead shall live over, over again for us. So this is a very impressive local effort. This was almost entirely funded by local contributions. When it was uh, installed, and this art, there's a, I should tell you where to, if you want to read more about this, there's a very good article in the East Tennessee History Journal of uh, 1978, but they wrote all the details down about how the money was raised and how it was installed and quite an event in 1892 when it was, um, when it was actually put up and they put a time capsule into the monument and the time capsule has lots of interesting things in it. I don't know if anyone has ever opened the time capsule or if the ladies decided when opening the time capsule was a good idea, but uh, it would be a fascinating thing to do as part of the sesquicentennial. If, if, uh, on the other hand, it may have been opened before now. I don't know that, but the contents of it are listed, and it says they are in a copper box, and so copper is a pretty good preservative, so whatever's in there, and, and in fact, they tell you in the article what's in there, fo photographs and programs and copy of a speech and that kind of thing, so uh, it could be, could be very interesting to open it up. Now, these Around the, the monument, around the statue, um, are these bronze plaques with names of soldiers. Um, it may be that there's not quite a one-to-one -one correspondence between the names and the bodies that are actually in there. It was difficult to do very 
precisely accurate research, but these names do represent the names of Confederate veterans who were in the area. So these were put up in the 1950s, so considerably after the time when the bodies were collected and reinterred. We were over there last spring with some writers from uh, all over, uh, tourism had brought in, and as I said, the cemetery is normally locked, so you can't get in. And so uh, a Georgia family, there was an 80-year-old grandmother, great-grandmother, and then some 60-year-old kids, and then 40, and then the young ones were back in Georgian school that day. But they'd been in Gatlinburg. But they had a fa piece of family history. They were not genealogists. They hadn't gone looking for their family story. But they knew somehow that the uh, oldest lady's great-grandfather had died in Knoxville, November 29th, 1863. Well, and they didn't, re they didn't know anything about the Battle of Knoxville. They didn't know the whole story of the, that we know as Civil War enthusiasts here. And... Uh, we, uh, w one of the people in the group checked with the ladies at Confederate Memorial Hall, confirmed his name, confirmed that he was on the list for being buried in the cemetery. These people were astounded to find that connection. This man had left behind a two-year-old son, and that son uh, was the grandfather of the 80-year-old lady. And so the great-grandfather came to Knoxville having left a son behind without that son, this whole branch of the family, and there were quite a few of them, would not be there. And they were just very touched to have that connection with, the, with their family past. And, and I thought it was particularly nice that it was a fall day, lots of beautiful red and yellow leaves. I don't know if they have maple trees in Georgia. I guess they don't, or, or at any rate, they were unusual. So they were collecting leaves so that they could press them and have a remembrance of, of their relative that was buried there. Now, this Union Monument has a very interesting story. It really was probably uh, because of the Confederate Monument that uh, they decided, well, you know, probably we'd, we better do something also. Because it was 1892 when the Confederate Monument went up, and very shortly thereafter they started planning for the Union Monument. This is a photograph of the, of the first monument. This is a postcard, colored postcard. Some of these are still out and about. And you can see it's kind of got a spires and doors. It, it, it was a castle motif. It turned in, there was lots of discussion as to what they were going to do. There were ideas of doing a big archway at National Cemetery or doing some kind of other monument or memorial all around town. A lot of discussion. It, again, was done by subscription. Uh, uh, some, of, some of the veterans, a dollar a piece, they collected some $7,000, a dollar at a time from Union veterans. And they, the final design ended up putting this brass eagle on top with his wings expanded. And this was uh, a symbol of, of unity, a symbol of the whole nation, and meant symbolically... Um, well, kind of a counterpoint to the Confederate soldier, which was, uh, oh, well, how far away? I don't know, two or three miles, wherever Knoxville. Everybody, does everybody know where Bethel Avenue is? Yeah, I'll show you on the map, too. But Bethel Avenue, and the, this one is on, uh, it's off Broadway at Tyson, um, it's right beside Old Gray Cemetery. They're side by side. So at any rate, here is the original monument for the, con for the Union soldiers, and... That's the monument today. The reason there is no eagle up there anymore was basically it was a huge lightning rod. It got struck by lightning. It exploded. The eagle absolutely flew into pieces all over Tyson Street, all over the, uh, the, the rest of the cemetery, and uh, that was it for the eagle. The, uh, they did manage to get a, a national uh, uh, government grant to rebuild, and they rebuilt it um, almost exactly as it had been. With the, and now inside, with these arches, there's a stained glass window. You can't, I don't think you can go in there. Has anybody ever been inside it? I think it's locked. But you can look in, you can get inside. But there's a stained glass window, and it has statistics about how many uh, Tennesseans fought for the Union, how many died. And um, it's really a very impressive monument. This statue is uh, four feet higher than the statue at the Confederate Cemetery, for whatever reason. 
And yeah. <laughs> and so this, this is the one that uh, almost nobody knows about. I mean, in this group, yes, I would assume that most everybody here has seen it, but most of Knoxville has no idea that this amazing monument is right here. The Old Gray Cemetery, named for the poem by Thomas Gray, Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard. It was actually started in 1850 as Knoxville's uh, out in the country cemetery, out there in Broadway at that time was way out in the country, so it was a country, country graveyard. It's really a beautiful place. It's, uh, uh, Alex Dempster tells us regularly, and it's absolutely true, it's an outdoor art gallery. The sculpture, the uh, symbolism, the history there, it's just an amazing place to visit. And uh, you can see when the uh, flowers are in bloom, it's, it's naturally lovely also. Oliver Perry Temple. Uh, yesterday, two days ago, I went out there with a camera and I probably took 40 pictures of the various people I've been talking about as in their final resting places. This, of course, Oliver Perry Temple wrote uh, in the 1890s, wrote a book about the um, Tennesseans during the Civil War. Uh, Horace Maynard, another name, his whole family is there. He, interestingly, I don't know if Jack Neely is here, but Jack has written an interesting article about um, Horace Maynard's second son, who actually died in the Caribbean while uh, fulfilling a statesman's post. He was there as a, as a, as a diplomat and died in the Caribbean. Um, so the Maynard family is all there. Pleasant McClung, I don't, those of you who have been to my other lecture, he, uh, lectures, he's the one who had his legs blown off during Sanders' raid in 1863, um, died hours later, and then he is buried right there in Old Gray Cemetery. Sue Boyd Barton, who grew up in um, the Blunt Mansion and went on to become, uh, for a little while at least, at least in her own mind, William Sanders' girlfriend until he was killed in uh, November of 1863. Her name is Sue Boyd Barton. She lived to be 85. Uh, she was um, uh, very prominent Socially, her, her husband, she uh, lived way longer than her husband did, had two sons, both of whom died, one who contracted yellow fever in the Philippines and died in San Francisco. So the stories in Old Gray Cemetery are so detailed and, and just names jump out at you when you've started to read anything about the history of the Civil War. Here are Eliza and Frank McClung and many of their children. Very uh, simple tombstones. There are some much more elaborate McClung stones, but Frank and Eliza's are very, very simple. Spot and Patty. I, I, I almost feel like they're, fr they're friends. <laughs> Spot was the one who uh, came up from Alabama and managed to get thrown out of the Confederate Army shortly after he joined. And then he, then he kept fighting anyway, even though he wasn't officially part of it. Ended up moving to Knoxville, married, met and married Patty. And uh, she continues to be in the Knoxville social pages, and she, she volunteers her time, and she's on the various boards of things and does charitable work. And uh, I, I just like the, the, what they put on their tombstone here. It just makes them the happy dead. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but somehow it seems very positive. <laughs> National Cemetery. Well, of course, National Cemetery, just over here, is where you're going to see that big monument. But the rest of it, as you can see, is huge. It's concentric circles. It starts in the middle. There's one central place, and then spokes go out from that, and the, and the graves are all uh, in, in concentric circles going out from that center. So the uh, names are facing towards the center of the circle makes it a little more difficult to read if you don't want to get out of your car. So you, need, you need, pretty much need to get out of your car to go look at what the, uh, the, what the stones say. But there are veterans here from every war since 1863. Uh, General Nalen is buried in here. And many of the names that we recognize from the Civil War stories around town. Joel P. Higley, for instance. Fort Higley on the south side of the river uh, was named for Joel Higley. He was a captain from Ohio. And when you look at the details, these are all Civil War stones. These guys are from New Hampshire, 
from North Carolina, from Tennessee, from Kentucky, all intermixed. The 79th Highlanders. This print was put out. I, I, I couldn't quite read the details, but it was in the later 1800s. And of course, visiting the graves of the fallen, recognizing those that fell away from home and far away. This was an important part of the regimental get-togethers, regimental history. And so this print was done for the Highlanders, and you can read all of the names on the stone. You can see here the center. This is the same uh, configuration that, that's there today, the center and then the, the, the graves radiating, radiating out from that. The 103rd Ohio came here um, shortly after Burnside showed up. They were stationed on the south side of the river. They were the green troops that faced Longstreet's veterans of Gettysburg and Chancellorsville and maybe I've got that right, Gettysburg and Fredericksburg and uh, Chickamauga. And they have met every year since 1888. Of course, now it's all of the descendants, but they have an organization on the lakes of, uh, uh, near Sandusky, Ohio, on the Great Lake up there. And this that was originally built as a barracks, and the guys would get together once a year and have a reunion. Now it's their um, museum, and uh, many of the families who are descendants of this regiment have homes on the lake. And every summer, faithfully, for a week, they get together as part of uh, the continuing tradition. They have 15 of their soldiers buried at, old, at National Cemetery here. Now, in the uh, history of the war, it's very interesting that in Knoxville, um, in, in, in 1864, in March, actually, they started a little earlier than that, but by March, they, the recruiting was going on very intensely. The first U.S. colored troops, heavy artillery, was formed and uh, was stationed here. And they have a little, bit, a little bit of time in Greenville, but mostly stationed in Knoxville. Uh, they had about 1,100 men maximum, and the records, the uh, handwritten regimental records, are fascinating to look at. That would be a great topic for a master's project or PhD dissertation to do this history, because the history of African Americans in Knoxville during and um, before, during, and even right after the war, is, it's hard to get at. And uh, one of the ways you can get some information, let's see if my computer's overheating, so one more time. There we go. These are graves of some of the U.S. colored troops. You can see here, Company I, 14th Regiment, U.S. Colored Infantry. Over here, Battery D, 1st U.S. Colored Heavy Artillery. But they're all intermixed. They're, they're, and behind them here, this, this man is the U.S. Navy World War I. Um, we have others, World War II. It's in one way, you might say that there was equality in death, that these stones were not designated in any way. There are, everyone has the same stones. These are U.S. colored troops, but they are, the, that insignia doesn't mean anything different than, than being uh, part of the Union Army. And here's a particular one, Freeman Welsh, Battery D, 1st U.S. Colored Heavy Artillery, died right after the war. And this uh, is a stone, if anyone has seen Steve Dean's documentary called Holding the High Ground, this is stone is featured there. The fact that this man uh, was free by, well, about a month um, when he died here in Knoxville. And again, as I said, the stones in and around are, are from all different wars and places. Okay. Now, this is an interesting uh, story. I, did a, a talk for uh, a lunch group from the Jewish Community Center. And um, one of the men at the talk said, did you know that the Jewish cemetery in Knoxville got started during the Civil War? I said, no, I had no idea. And he gave me some fascinating research that had been done. Um, the old Jewish cemetery is at the corner, corner of Linden and Winona. 
And in the Knoxville Daily Register, which is the Confederate paper published here in 1862, it says that Private Joseph Schwab, Country C, 1st Infantry, Maine's Tennessee Infantry Regiment, also known as the Rock Sea Guards, that his body was returned from Virginia and he was buried in the uh, Jewish cemetery. Well, he was one of the first, I, I believe that um, there was no Jewish cemetery until this point. So he would, these Jewish veterans were the first. This is what the cemetery looks like, it's small. And these are the stones. This is uh, Joseph Schwab, 1862. And over here, this is uh, Isaac Stern. So these two young men were Confederate volunteers. Now, every time you start to go into uh, study things, you always find questions. This says that he was born in 1911, which makes him 52, which seems rather old for... Pr yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, no, it makes him... If he died in 63 and he was born in 11, he's 52 years old, right? That's old for a private. And then I thought, well, maybe that's his father, but no, his father's name was not Joseph. So, not quite sure about that date of birth, but the date of death certainly co corresponds with serving in the uh, Confederate Army. Plus, both of these young men died of disease, which was by far the more common way for people to pass on during the war. Now... Sometimes there are monuments to individuals, and this is a story that was here in the museum from uh, Ellen McClung Green and her husband, uh, Judge John Green. Judge John Green was the son of Lieutenant Colonel Francis Marion Green from Oxford, Mississippi. I think that's such a wonderful name and has this Revolutionary War heritage and all of that. But uh, Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Green uh, died at Spotsylvania in Virginia. And uh, there in John Green's letters that talks about taking a special trip to find his father's grave. They took a picture of the tombstone and had it professionally mounted and, you know, used before digital cameras. You remember when we all used to, it, it was important if something was important, you would hire a professional photographer and had it, have it mounted and all of that. And anyway, that's what they did. And this was uh, almost a family shrine to uh, the fact that this man had died up there in Virginia. So this is a picture of the stone uh, in the Virginia Cemetery. Now, this is a very sad story. And how many here have heard of E.S. Dodd, Ephraim Shelley Dodd? He was a young man from Texas. He was in the Texas Rangers. This is not a real tomb. Well, it is a real tombstone, but there's not a real body underneath it. And it's actually, it was purchased, and this can be done to commemorate this man's death because we know for a fact he died here in Knoxville. But this one is uh, out in the garden near Bleak House on uh, Kingston Pike. And it was bought, I believe, by the UDC to commemorate the death of this young man. He... Uh, it's also interesting here, too. This is called the Orth Map, and um, we're familiar with it because of the um, detail for Fort Sanders. But over here in this script, it documents the hanging of Ephraim Shelley Dodd. When Longstreet left town in December, early December of 63, he apparently hanged a couple of Michiganders on the way out of town as spies. Uh, and so there was a feeling of... Um, needing to even the score. Also, the gallows had been used uh, for bridge burners and other Unionists during the occupation and, and during the hold of the Confederate time period. And there was the idea, too, that a uh, Confederate needed to be hung there also, hanged there also. Uh, when I, I've read the transcript of Dodd's trial. Uh, they said he, he was a spy. He was, in fact, wearing a Union overcoat. So was every Confederate out there who could have taken a Confederate overcoat off uh, someone who fell maybe at Campbell Station, maybe from the supplies that were left. Uh, it, it's just that was not c concrete. He write, wrote a diary, and apparently he, he, wrote, he wrote with the Texas Rangers. He came to up with Wheeler to the south side of Knoxville, got separated from the cavalry, trying to get back, and um, probably he did impersonate 
a, a Yankee when he was behind the Yankee lines, that makes sense. Whether he was a spy who was there to collect information to pass on for the uh, benefit of the Confederate troops, probably not. But there was circumstantial evidence that somehow he was uh, impersonating a Union, uh, a Union soldier. So. At first he was acquitted. He was going to be sent out of, back, out of town. He was going to be sent to a prison camp. His story is detailed also in Ellen Renshaw House's uh, story, uh, not, um, diary, A Very Violent Rebel. Well, in any case, he was um, um, uh, pulled, pulled out of line, and they said, no, you're, you're guilty. You will hang. And they did hang him. It was a terrible way to go also. The first time the rope broke, and he fell and broke his leg, and then he had to be hung again. It, so it was a terrible story, and uh, probably a man who was not guilty of the crime for which he was, he was convicted. So this, this stone does commemorate who he was and that he died here. Now another, of course, is William Sanders. And Sanders has an interesting story. He, we know that he was shot on the hillside outside Second Presbyterian, present day present Presbyterian Church across the street from Crescent Bend. Uh, he was taken downtown to the Bijou, well, it's called Lamar House at the time. He died there at the Lamar House Hotel. He was buried at Second Presbyterian uh, Cemetery. Um, now, Second Presbyterian at that time was down on Church Street, across the street from the uh, Methodist Church. So there were two churches there on Church Street, uh, and um, so, that he, so Sanders was buried there. Well, of course, later, the church land was sold. Second Presbyterian Church moved down to where it is now, off Kingston Pike, and the land was sold, and most, many of the bodies were moved to Old Gray Cemetery. And maybe that's when Sanders was moved. We know from a letter that was written right after Sanders was, was, was killed, this was a, le a letter written by um, William Harris to Sanders' mother, saying that he was going to be buried here, but it was Sanders' wish to be buried in Kentucky so that that would, be, that would happen later. Well, Sanders never got to Kentucky. And in fact, there's his grave in Chattanooga. And his, the records in Chattanooga don't say exactly when he got there. Uh, they're kind of vague as to when he showed up. So there is in the local paper, the alt uh, chapter of the, of the veteran, veterans group, um, and one of their, I think it was in the 1890s, and I'd have to recheck that date, but it was, it was fairly long after the war. It says that they have, this is still in Knoxville, that they have to go and tend to the grave of Sanders, which is still here in town. So that gives us a little more of a, a, a zeroing in on when he was actually moved. But uh, this is a photo of his grave in Chattanooga. Thank you, Tammy. <laughs> now this is, this is a little more upbeat. John Mason Boyd, this is a beautiful monument. Everybody knows where this is, the corner of the old courthouse at Gay and, Gay, is it Gay and, not Maine, Gay and Maine, yes. Um, and it was, it says in memoriam to our, to our beloved physician, Dr. John Mason Boyd. He was Sue Boyd's older brother. He was a surgeon in the Confederate Army. He was a doctor in Knoxville for many, many years, very highly respected. And uh, when he died, the citizens of Knoxville took up a collection. Again, pennies from school children, very broad community support to put this monument up for him. So uh, it doesn't say anything particularly about the Civil War, except that he was a very good man who was valued by the community. And um, uh, his, this monument is, well, just a block or two away from where he practiced medicine for so many years out of Blunt Mansion. And another interesting individual, Father Abram Ryan, Apparently, at least from one of the biographies I read of John Mason Boyd, he and Abram, Father Abram Ryan were good friends. Father Ryan came to town, Catholic priest, shortly after the Civil War. You can see the dates there. He was called the Poet Priest of the Confederacy. And uh, he was here at Immaculate Conception Church, which is uh, down, well, how to explain it. <laughs> Does everybody know where Immaculate Conception Church is? It's, at the, it's on the uh, precipice looking over the train tracks at the, at the far end of downtown. And um, he was here for a couple of years and uh, is, has, has a very interesting story of his own. But that, this is the kind of plaque that uh, 
our historical commission. Is that the one? That's all. Oh, well, we'll get on to that. Relics and reunions. In the 1890, there was a blue and gray reunion here, and these things, I'm going to go through these quickly so I can get on to another topic, but um, these, these are the kinds of things that commemorate in a small way, in a personal memento way. And this is a, a copy, of, well, a picture of the medal that was uh, designed and created for the 1890 reunion. You can see there the little soldiers going up. It's, it's really quite a lot steeper and taller than it was in real life, but this is the uh, a battle, a, a representation of the Battle of Fort Sanders. And this is the back side of it. And like the New York Regiment, this is the blue and the gray soldier shaking hands, um, coming together. This is 1890, which is uh, almost 30 years before the uh, New York uh, Regiment monument went in. And there were other uh, many other gatherings of veterans here. This one, it says delegate, and it's sons of veterans, and this is actually the group that came after the GAR, Grand Army of the Republic. And this says Knoxville, and you can't see it too well, but there is a representation here of, of Knoxville, Tennessee. This is another one, those who are into numismatics, <laughs> coins and medals and that sort of thing. These are very impressive pieces. Um, this one says 1895, National Encampment, Knoxville, Tennessee. And on, in the center, there's a Latin inscription that translates roughly, thanks, thanks to God for saving us. And that's a good motto for veterans, certainly. Now, this is something that I found that I haven't seen many of. This is... China, yes, obviously, it's got the little roses on it, but in the center, Battle of Fort Sanders, November 29th, 1863, Knoxville, Tennessee, and then on the back it says, uh, China made in Austria for Cullen and Gammon, Knoxville, Tennessee, and I'm hoping there's somebody in the audience who knows who Cullen and Gammon are. Does anybody recognize that name? Um, it was not uncommon for... Uh, people who purveyors of fine china to have uh, commemorative plates done. Um, and this one obviously was done for Knoxville audience. Okay, I'm going to go through these quickly. As you know, there are a lot of plaques out there. Some of them you can stop and read. This one, maybe so. This is at the top of the hill where you would enter into Fort Dickerson. Um, but it's not easy to find, and it's, uh, anyway... But this is the, uh, the, the Tennessee Historical Commission for years has been putting up these kinds of plaques. And uh, they, they are certainly serve a purpose. Without them, so many of these sites would not have any recognition at all. So um, I want to show you a few of these around town. This is, again, at the top of the hill at Fort Sanders, not too far from the UDC monument to the Battle of Fort Sanders. Uh, again, there's nothing much else there, but there is a sign that describes the attack, the assault on November 29th. Wiltsey, Battery Wiltsey. This is very near the Immaculate Conception Church where Father Ryan was. And this, is, this is a nice secluded place. You can actually get up in that area and park the car and look at the view. You can understand why there was a battery positioned at this place. You can see the nice expanse out towards the railroad tracks and beyond there. Um, and uh, Wiltsey was a... Uh, uh, an officer from Michigan. Many of the site, many of the batteries and forts were named for Michiganders. Fort Byington. Well, this is right on UT campus. This is on the sign is on uh, uh, Kingston Pike. It's not easy to get to, actually. I, I, between the construction on the hill, student traffic, one-way streets, and uh, Kingston Pike, it, it's not an easy one to stop and read. But this is um, on the strip of land. Well, obviously, this is, the, uh, this is the old library across the street. And this is Cumberland here, not Kingston Pike. And again, Tennessee Historical Commission put this one up a long time ago. These are, most of them are fairly weathered. Um, those numbers at the top, there should be a list somewhere. I went looking all over the Internet for it. I found one place that told me there were 860 of these things in Tennessee and another one that told me there were 1,230. Uh, I guess it depends on, 
Uh, you know, that sometimes it's the Tennessee Historical Commission, and then there are historic uh, landmarks. There are um, National Historic Register signs. It depends on what you include in historic marker. But there are many of them, and of course, they're not simply, uh, uh, they're, not, they're more than the Civil War era. They're all historic eras. Now, sometimes, you can see how short this one is, and it's a little, it looks like the uh, bulldozer hit it while it was re-landscaping. This one is down on Nayland Drive, at, just at the end, right very close to our, to our museum. And it says, West Wing of Burnside's Entrenchments. Sometimes these signs get moved when people, when the road gets widened, when the highway department uh, does some improvement. Um, so I'm not sure how close this is to... Uh, where it was originally put in, although maybe it's exactly where it was where it was originally put in. But it's again, it's one of those. It's very difficult to stop and read if you're interested. And then this one out at Campbell Station, also busy street, but important because for many many years this was all that was out there to mark the spot. However. We now have a new program, Tennessee Civil War Trails Program. It's supported by our Department of Tourism and Transportation and also local spots. The, the people who are sponsor the original um, uh, installation cost of $1,100 are local, and it, then it's a $200 a year maintenance fee. But then you get to participate in this program with uh, very good advertising and signage. This is our former mayor, Bill Haslam, opening the uh, sign at Old Gray Cemetery last year. And that's what the sign looks like. They're, they're, they're nicely done. They are unobtrusive. They kind of blend into the scenery, but they have good, well-established uh, documentation of why the site is important. And also GPS coordinates and podcasts and all sorts of things that go out uh, making this site now part of the network. Um, so all of the sites here, for instance, now remember that poor sign out in uh, Campbell Station, right where the monument, well, no mon where no monument was? Farragut has done a beautiful job of installing this Admiral Farragut statue. And these are actual cannons from his, uh, from his ship. I don't know who managed to find those and get them to be uh, part of the Farragut uh, park here, but it's a wonderful um, addition to knowing about what happened to Civil War, what Civil War history. Of course, Farragut didn't do anything in Farragut except be born there, but <laughs> that's a pretty good story. <laughs> now, also Bleak House or Confederate Memorial Hall has a Civil War trail sign. Fort Dickerson has a Civil War trail sign, and Fort Dickerson has been quite active in, in, uh, for, for many years because of the Civil War Roundtable. Um, Civil War Roundtable cleans up the park and helps spread mulch, and uh, once a year puts on a Living History Weekend. So Fort Dickerson has been one of the sites in town where uh, we have commemorated Civil War history fairly consistently. And here's another one of those Civil War trail signs. This is up near the top of the hill at Fort Sanders. And, of course, museums and exhibits. Everybody knows this one. <laughs> and we will continue with the lecture program and um, having uh, periodic uh, information on our website about things going on here about with Civil War interest. And, of course, your wonderful East Tennessee Historical Society, History Center downtown, this, the uh, exhibits, and then the McClung collection, the documentation, the county records, all of the genealogy possibilities. This is a real treasure for all of us who want to research Civil War time. And Farragut Folklife Museum, I just took this out of their newsletter. They, have, uh, they will be doing a Civil War exhibit. They will be having speakers um, throughout the summer, and they will be uh, concentrating on their Civil War heritage. So uh, these are three places, but we're also, I want to make, be sure in the last four minutes to talk about this. South of the river, there's a wonderfully ambitious project to save a thousand acres of land. Um, the Aslan Foundation 
has saved Fort Higley in 2007 and some of the Log Haven property. Uh, Battle of Armstrong Hill si or River Bluff site, which is on the river side of the, of the property south of the river, has been purchased by Legacy Parks and they're trying to get Fort Stan the land at Fort Stanley. The object is to start at IMs and have greenways and trails and open space and history interpreted. It's just beautiful land and it is so close to our urban center and so much in danger. It's a, it's several times now, several, a lot of this acreage was slated to go condo and has been saved uh, because of a downturn in the economy. So this is a very important community project. Um, this is what it looked like when the land was cleared for the condominiums that are, that are there now. All this red dirt, in fact, Civil War bullets came out of the ground, a sword came out of the ground, a jawbone with teeth in it, human, came out of the ground up here, and yet uh, this was still allowed to be developed because we, we really weren't, couldn't, couldn't make the case for this being valuable Civil War site. Part of it is still saved, uh, part of it is now saved because of the purchase of, of the land by Legacy Parks and the Aslan Foundation. This beautiful quarry on Fort Dickerson property is just spectacular. If there's been a new access road created, it is now accessible. And, and you, it's, for years, it's kind of been a hidden treasure, um, but it's now been made accessible by um, the city parks. And this is a view across the river looking at the Bluff property. These ridge tops, this beautiful Tennessee land is so important to preserve. And this is what Fort, Dicker, uh, Fort Stanley looks like. This was a we were up there in a monsoon. It was, and the sun just came out, but it was so hot and wet. But you can see there are still earthworks, Civil War era earthworks on Fort Stanley. And this property is, uh, hope, hopefully they'll raise enough money to purchase it. Um, also, we've been doing some Civil War archaeology. I'll go through this quickly. This is at Fort Higley. Beautiful, uh, uh, deep, the, the, the exact fort is still there. All of these, it's interrupted in a couple of places by modern construction, but all of the earthworks are there. The gum emplacements are there. You can see where the, probably the powder magazine was. And uh, because of the archaeology and survey here, we have uh, very precise records of, of what it looks like now and how well preserved it is. And hopefully this site will be opened, interpreted, made available for the for public to appreciate. Um, Fort Higley cabin site, this is down in a beautiful cove to the south of Fort Higley. Um, the local story is that it was used as a hospital during the Battle of, of uh, um, Armstrong Hill. Unfortunately, we did not prove that it was used as a hospital, but we did not not prove it, so <laughs> I think that's, that's important. <laughs> Uh, and it was, it, the artifacts that came out of it did establish the site as a, uh, a settler's cabin. All of the ceramics were right and uh, mostly it was excavated that area. Here is right in front of the hearth and um, we had some very interesting, wait a minute, very interesting stuff come out of the, uh, um, what was a root cellar in front of the hearth. So uh, it was a very, it was a fascinating experience. I wish we'd found that femur with a mini ball in it that we all hoped for, but that didn't happen, so. And then there was another, wait a minute. Um, excavation done. This was done on the UT property a front, in front of uh, Tyson Junior High School. Uh, this was a Confederate gun emplacement. They, we know that uh, Kershaw was, well, he was basically over here in Crescent Bend, and we had artillery from um, South Carolina, wait a minute, artillery from Georgia and troops from South Carolina in this Confederate um, gun emplacement. You can see some of the features along here, these are the hearths that are dug into the wall so these guys could try to keep warm. And uh, the artifacts, if you're interested, a number of the artifacts from this d dig are, display, are on display on the wall out here and uh, to the left of the Fort Sanders exhibit. One of the beautiful pieces of uh, ceramics that came out of there, this is Edgefield pottery. Uh, produced in South Carolina and Georgia, very consistent. These guys were in this position for about two weeks, 150 years ago, and yet the stuff that came out of the ground was very, very clearly 
left by them. And this is, this is a little bit of a, of a, I edited this to show you the Knoxville Civil War Gateway Center, but we have, a, have an agreement with the wonderful folks at Blunt Mansion that their visitor center at the top of Gay Street Bridge will be our downtown Civil War Gateway. This will give people a place to go in and get uh, walking tours, learn about the history of Knoxville downtown and the areas. Driving tours will be provided, and um, it'll just be a way for people to have a, a single location to go to begin learning about the history of Knoxville Civil War. East Tennessee Alliance, Civil War Alliance, this group's been meeting for about uh, four years now to get ready for the um, sesquicentennial planning. This group, it's a Alliance, as it says, uh, um, many of the historic home folks, the museum folks, the university, um, all get together to talk in one place once a month about uh, joint promotion and support of each other's uh, efforts. And I'm going to stop because I've <laughs> I've, I always prepare way too much material for it, for it but uh, let me just go down. You want to you want to see them? Uh, all right. If you're in, if if you're good with this, I'll keep going. These wonderful historic homes were all here during the Civil War. Um, they all have incredible stories. This one, of course, is Bleak House. This was Longstreet's headquarters during the Siege of Knoxville. That tower, um, I think everybody knows the story about the cannonball being fired from Fort Sanders, hitting the tower, rooting the uh, sharpshooters out of there. Uh, Crescent Bend was occupied by Kershaw, General Kershaw from South Carolina, and uh, uh, this was... Uh, uh, taken over, well, McLaws also, there are a couple of generals that stayed here. The generals get to stay in the houses, the troops did not. Um, at Chris, uh, Boyd family story at Blunt Mansion. Uh, Blunt Mansion has a wonderful colonial story, has always had a uh, rich uh, interpretation of that time period, but until recently, it really didn't know too much about its Civil War history. And so they are delighted to have another story to tell and also very happy to uh, share that building at the top of the Gay Street Bridge with us so that we can um, uh, tell their story and the larger story from a location downtown. Of course, Mabry Hazen House, in association with Bethel Cemetery and uh, the fact that this one was occupied by troops through, or through, by officers and troops on the ground throughout the war. Um, Ramsey House, the Ramsey family were very staunch Confederates. This was not J.G.M. Ramsey's house. His house was burned to the ground along with his historical library, but this, he, this was the house he was raised in and the house where his parents lived. And then out at Campbell Station, this one, the Russell House, um, hopefully is going to be saved. It's on the market. It's, uh, they're uh, hoping to be able to preserve it and interpret the story of the, of course, it predates the Civil War, but it was there, owned by the Russell family during the Civil War. And I wanted to show you this one. <laughs> this is true. The guy on the right is a real person. They both came from Mississippi. Um, when I went to do some research on um, Peyton, I found out his parents' names were Sis and Bud. That's not very useful when you go looking for ancestors. So they have real names, and I have. I actually wrote to Archie, the father, uh, and said, "Oh no, it was Archie's parents who were Sis and Bud. Archie is the father, the grandfather." Anyway, so I didn't get too far on it. But uh, if you imagine, and I've done this sometimes, if you have a smart board in class, you can put a mustache and long hair on Peyton, the football player, and. Uh, the, uh, he has the same hooded eyes. His nose is similar. They're both Peyton Manning from Mississippi. I can't believe they're not somehow related, if not distantly, but they may be closely related. This guy was about 5'4", 120 pounds, would not have done well in the football leagues. However, he was quite a fighter, apparently. He nearly killed a guy and was stabbed himself when he was in military school. He was on Longstreet staff for most of the war. Some of the books say he was here. I don't think he was. I, I don't think he came with Longstreet, but he was definitely down in uh, Chattanooga with Longstreet before they came this way. So that's all. <laughs> <laughs>